have no idea how to start this video. Okay, here we go. Racism in America. Ew, no. Who's that for? Are you racist? Yes, you are, you liar. White people are toxic and I disown them all. Hey kids, today's lesson, we're talking about racism. What the fuck is wrong with me? What's going on? Why is it so hard to talk about race in this country? Placeholder introduction. All right. Ah! Okay, so during quarantine, I decided to go back and watch every episode of The Simpsons. Seasons one through 12 were great. I had a wonderful time. But now I'm on season 22 um, and it, 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 it hurts. It's like The Simpsons as an entire cake and I just ate a third of it myself and it was super fun, but now I've got two thirds of a cake to finish and I don't have a Matilda to cheer me on. It's honestly been harder than I expected it to be and no person should have to go through this. However, speaking of things that no person should have to go through, today I want to talk about season 22, episode 13 of The Simpsons, the episode where Lisa owns a slave. Now, before I say another word, let me be very clear. Racism in media is most prevalent in this cross-section between privilege and power, and the conversation of racial oppression in media is not one that should be led by a white, non-oppressed, gay male. There is no shortage of incredible creators that can generate a more informed and coherent perspective on race in their selective fields, and you should absolutely go check them out. However, this episode of The Simpsons is specifically spearheaded by this unintentional theme of white fragility and insecure panic that comes with the fear of being perceived as racist. And I don't know if you've noticed, but being white and insecure is a topic that is very much in my lane. Now you have two groups of races out there. You have group one, which are people who genuinely believe that certain races are better than the other, which is wrong. And group two, well-intentioned, however, mostly white people who are honestly naive to the fact that most of their actions contribute to the continuous repression of people of color. And that second part is what I wanna focus on because white fragility is the discomfort and defensiveness on the part of white people when confronted with the information about inequality or injustice. So, folks, Let's get into the color yellow and how it inadvertently spells out many damaging assumptions about race in America. Cheers, let's start with the plot. The color yellow centers around Lisa as she's tasked with doing a presentation for Black History Month. Lisa finds the old diary of Eliza Simpson, Lisa's great ancestor from the 1860s. Although when first reading, it seems like most of her ancestors were all bad people, sort of a motley crew of horse thieves and deadbeats, it turns out Eliza was actually cataloging her journey of how she attempted to free a slave named Virgil. Eliza writes that she succeeds in her escape and hides Virgil in her family's turnip shed. With pride, Lisa gives her presentation of this in front of the school to find out she only had half the story. Milhouse reveals through his ancestry that despite Eliza's efforts, Virgil was still caught. This discourages Lisa, but back at home, Grandpa Simpson unveils that there is even more to the story, where the ancestral version of Marge revolts against the racist version of Homer and the slave owners. Then she escapes with Virgil to Canada for a happily ever after, thus proving that the Simpsons do have good ancestors in their bloodline after all. So, um... My problem here isn't so much about the story. The white fragility comes from intent. Lisa's not diving into her history so she can understand the complexity. She's searching for information that makes her feel better about her own existence. She's uncomfortable with the idea that her ancestors did not believe in equality like she does. So she's very driven to find proof that that's not 100% true. After learning that Eliza hid Virgil in her shed, she stops looking for information because it validated what she wanted to hear and says, our family has heroes. Cut, print, burn the books. But when she's actually confronted with the truth, she can't take it and runs off crying. Not because she was personally affected, but because now she once again has to face the truth that she has no good ancestors. So that alone would have been a decent narrative. If they had stopped here and let the characters reflect on this new information that they know, it would have been fine. I mean, it wouldn't have been fine, but it would have been better, which 
is fine. But that's not where this episode ends. Grandpa Simpson continues the narrative, providing this victorious ending that once again validates the worldview that Lisa is most comfortable with. So you're actually descended from Virgil, not Hiram. Are you happy? Yes, I'm thrilled. And that is emotionally where this episode ends, with a lighthearted hurrah. So any whisper of honesty is completely trampled by this love wins triumphant ending. A gallant white lady running off with a freed slave, becoming fugitives of the law, falling in love, getting married, casually meeting Abraham Lincoln, running off to Canada, and then Marge files paperwork to legally divorce her husband. <laughs> you know, just all things that were super possible in 1865. And I get it, it's a fictional story from a comedy show, but in this episode, the history that's told is being played completely straight. This isn't one of those glorified clip shows where they retell Shakespeare plays with Simpson characters. The Simpsons treat this history like it's real, which causes the audience to do the same. And I do find it weird that they chose Grandpa Simpson to be the one who reveals the ending. He's the one character that's known for his nonsense rambling. Plus, like 20 episodes later in the next season, they say this about him. First, we're visiting Grandpa. No fair, we just went to church. Yeah, so we've already heard stories from thousands of years ago about stuff that didn't happen. Admittedly, this doesn't have a lot to do with white fragility, but I do think it's weird that in an already absurd and heightened story about slavery, they chose the least trustworthy character to come in and tell everyone, don't worry, in the end, the slave escaped and everyone was happy. I believe in the scientific community, we call that not a good look. But still, despite all that, as nice as the story between Virgil and Marge was, they were not the main characters of this narrative or Lisa's presentation. It was Eliza, a girl who didn't actually do anything. She tried to help, failed, and then was told by a slave owner she should mind her own business and then she did. The only thing she did do was regret not doing more. And here is where the white fragility is front and center. Lisa sees no issue in making a black history presentation about a white ancestor who realistically did nothing. Black History Month is for black history. By all means, have pride for the people in your life that weren't monsters. But if your conversation around slavery begins and ends with white nobility, you are entirely missing the point. And if you think having one ancestor doing one thing justifies saying Simpsons equals heroes, you're not just being offensive, you're also wrong. This is exactly how climate change deniers shape their mentality. They find a tiny piece of info that lines up with what they want to believe, and they use that one contradiction to invalidate the entire argument to justify the belief that the world is not a scary place and there is no problem for them to be a part of. In the 1800s, Thomas Jefferson tried to use the scientific community to prove that black people were inferior to whites. He was not looking to see if there were actually differences between races. He was looking to see what differences he could find so that he could justify and label what he already perceived as inferior, and there's a big difference between those things. Lisa's presentation does not make her a racist, it just means that her presentation is. And to explain what I mean, we need to discuss a super fun word I don't think enough people are talking about. Colloquial. You see, it's fun because it's got a wee in it. Jane, edit that out. So colloquial refers to a type, part, or usage of speech as it exists in regular conversation. Typically when that definition of speech strays from its original or literal definition. For example, in American English, the word bitch is the scientific term for a female dog. Come here, buddy. Up, up, up. Now Tango here is a boy, so calling him a bitch would be incorrect. However, it just so happens that he is a 70 pound mutt that's afraid of the cat. So if I were to call him a bitch by today's standard, which is a misogynistic insult to imply that someone is an inferior or feminine, that second term would be the colloquial definition. It wasn't the intended use. However, still applies. Are you done? He's done. <laughs> anyway, uh, that second term would be the colloquial definition. It's just as valid, but it's currently being used for an unintended purpose from past standards. So, the technical and formal definition of the word racist without context in its simplest form was meant to candidly describe 
a policy or system based on race or a person who subscribes to the same. But of course, since the overwhelming majority of policies and systems based on race through history have this incredibly damning and negative prejudice, the colloquial definition of racist is entirely negative because of the implied historical context of evil. So, technically speaking, this entire video is racist because its sole purpose is to call out individuals and discuss race. But does it classify as racist in today's colloquial standards? Well, I guess we'll just find out in my comment section below now, won't we? Ugh, Jesus Christ, this could be a nightmare in there. But my point with bringing up all this literal definition jargon is because white people are often taught racism is bad, but we're not properly trained to identify the severity of each situation. And I think the quote from filmmaker Omowale Akatunde sums it up best. He says, For most whites, racism is like murder. The concept exists, but someone has to commit it in order for it to happen. This limited view of such a multi-layer syndrome cultivated the sinister nature of racism and, in fact, perpetuates racist phenomena rather than eradicates them. In order to identify racism, we need to strip it from its modern connotations and understand that racism does not exist in black or white. It's more of a gradient, and every racist act has different effects based on the context and historical value. And that brings us to our next example of white fragility in this episode because yeah there are more and different kinds you gotta hand it to white people we love to commit so as lisa tries to read more into eliza's diary we get this from her family it's a great story lisa and you should stop reading right there what, what are you doing i want to know what happens next well i don't the motto of the simpsons is quit while you're ahead i made it into a sampler Right. So, most anti-blackness is rooted in misinformation or the lack of historical knowledge, however, can also be found in white people's unwillingness to see problems that don't affect them. There are a lot of bad people on this planet who are actively trying to implement systems that make life harder for people of color. And when white people ignore these racist policies, like police reform in low-income neighborhoods, we become complicit in their effectiveness. And it's super easy to do so. We grew up not having to worry about it. It's not on our radar, but we can't keep living in a bubble. White people need to be aware of government implemented policies that affect people of color with the same fervor as a racist cop who might see a black person wearing a hoodie. Oof, I'm like dabbling with this edgy humor and it is make me nervous. <laughs> Now, I completely understand why Marge and Homer would want to shield their daughter from a history that is so contemptuous. But there are two outcomes here. They can either wait out the clock and assume Lisa will find out the correct information in her own time, or Lisa will go her entire life believing a lie about her own past. Both of those kind of sound awful. Homer and Marge are so afraid of coming to terms with the subject of racism that they are actively pulling Lisa away. I, I honestly don't think I can find a better metaphor for white fragility myself. And to put it simply, doing this is racist. Now, some people will respond to this news with much contempt. They will grasp their pearls and come up below with denial and anger because this concept of white fragility could never apply to them or their favorite characters because they are nice people. Hashtag not all white people. Hashtag I have a black friend. But that reaction always reminds me of middle school. I did community theater when I was like 12 to 15. You know, the age where everyone's just trying to figure out who the hell they are and trying to be as normal as possible while doing it. And I remember there was one boy who was just as flamboyant as can be. The human embodiment of Mm. But, when asked about being gay by some noisy girl or smart-ass troll, he would make this huge deal and cause this massive scene in protest of the ludicrous concept that he could possibly be a gay guy doing musical theater. And of course everything's fine now because he's out and proud and living his best life as he deserves. And to be fair, I was just as deep in denial about my own sexuality as he was. But my point is that what I learned at a very young age is that when the very topic of conversation brings you from zero to six, it's usually because that individual is clinging on to a hidden truth that they are terrified about being known. And I'm not saying those middle schoolers were right to bully that gay kid, but sometimes things that trigger us white people 
are true. So look, the goal here isn't to never be racist. I myself will never not be racist because it's baked into our society and also abolishing all racism kind of feels like a utopian pipe dream. The goal here is to be anti-racist. And being anti-racist is about continuously supporting an existence that does not assume people's capabilities based on their skin color or the language they speak. Now, some harsh words are spoken about white people today, and although I believe that harshness was deserved, I can also empathize with folks that are just now learning about racial oppression in this country. And I'm not saying we need to be nicer to racists, but we often approach the topic by telling white people that their heritage and lifestyle is toxic and bad and that they should stop it. Please educate yourself and do better. And like I said, we can universally agree that racism is bad, but when it comes to the definition of what constitutes racism, it can be much harder to pin down. Like, the reason that we're here is that white people don't understand that there's a huge problem they need to improve on, so telling them without context to get better who is that helping? Racism surrounds us. Even the messaging of the American dream promotes this false sense of unique individualism. As the great poet Drake has once said, started from the bottom, now we're here. And when someone comes along to tell you that what you thought the bottom was actually isn't the bottom and the only reason you've accumulated the success that you have is because of class, geography, and skin color, accepting that can be difficult emotional work work that absolutely must be done, but still difficult. I personally have all the patience in the world for people who are trying to learn and better themselves. People like Lisa Simpson, who I know would be open and sympathetic to this conversation. But despite all my empathy, nothing will change until white people realize that the loss of absolute power is not the same as persecution. Okay, so that, that was me spiraling for a little bit, but Let's get back to The Simpsons. So this third aspect of white fragility actually has nothing to do with the characters. I want to focus on the writers and producers because the color yellow ends like this. I'm thrilled. We've regained our family honor and we're 164th black. So that's why I'm so cool. That's why my jazz is so smooth. And that's why I earn less than my white coworkers. What the f Coolness and the ability to play jazz are a product of education and culture. They are not something you can assimilate through a bloodline. This is not a new or woke idea. Thomas Jefferson and his slave-owning ass proved it with the science he could not find. And if I want to be petty, which I absolutely do because my mental illness demands it, ooh ooh. Lisa actually learns a lot about jazz and the blues from Bleeding Gums Murphy, played by Ron Taylor back in season one. This line from the end of the episode actually negates the work of an oppressed person of color and replaces it with natural selection. Okay, so we've got an episode that's taking notable steps back when it comes to understanding the problems of race in this country. And also, it's not funny. And this is where my patience runs completely dry, because at most times, I don't even know what they're making fun of. Follow me north to freedom. I don't think so. Why, because I'm young and I'm a woman? No, because you're pointing south. <laughs> oh, right, right. Sorry, it's my first time. That's all right, it's my 14th. Uh-oh, the, the slave tried to escape 13 times, but he, he failed. What? What's up? What's up with that? And the girl doesn't know know what direction to walk because she's eight. Oh, wacky old Simpsons, you know. I'm not sure how much more I can take. <laughs> um. No, but seriously, who are these jokes for? So this episode was written by Ian Max Tone Graham and Billy Kimball. These two combined have zero credits that would qualify them to write an episode like this, and I'm assuming neither did the tens of people who had to read, rewrite, and approve this episode to be produced in the first place. Now, in my opinion, there are two reasons why these two would feel obligated to write or even pitch this garbage white savior propaganda in the first place. Either one, they are bad writers who thought this was an objectively well thought out and funny episode of The Simpsons, or two, you made it to score woke points with your fellow liberals and thought writing a script where a white person feels bad for slavery would make you look more progressive and sympathetic. Now condescension aside, 
I am more strict on The Simpsons because I believe, especially these days, it's perceived as a more progressive institution than it actually is. We, as white people, need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. We need to get on that stage and present in front of our class that our great-grandfather turned in a slave for a pair of shoes. We need to let our children read history books and allow them to comprehend critically that Thomas Jefferson was a racist old hypocrite. And when we are writing our movies and our television about slavery, we need at least one black person in the room. Like, come on guys. And also white people, stop crying. This isn't about your pain. True acceptance comes from understanding, not from feeling bad. It is not the responsibility of black people to fix this problem, it is ours. We said slavery was okay. We passed the legislation and now we need to reverse it. Linked below is a list of things that will help you discuss race. Also linked below are Twitter and YouTube pages of creators and activists who are just really, really great for integrating into your social bubble. Reading these two books are also a wonderful place to start. Anyway, that's all I got. Uh, thank you so much for watching all of this video because God knows it, 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 is, it is too long. <laughs> um, yeah, please stay safe out there and have a wonderful rest of your day.